I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Welcome to the Mansion of Leaves of Glen. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion, and I'm not just uh, recording in my basement. Uh, this is where I read the hottest in public domain books and short stories. This week, uh, we're going to keep reading uh, from Chapter 10 of The Hound of Baskervilles by Arthur Conan Doyle. Yeah, you want to know a little bit about the author? Sure you do. Never gets old. Uh, Sir Arthur Ignatius Conan Doyle was born the 22nd of May, 1859. He died the 7th of July, 1930. Ooh, lived a long life. He's a British writer and a physician. He created the character Sherlock Holmes in 1887 for A Study in Scarlet, uh, the first of four novels and 56 short stories about Holmes and Dr. Watson. Ugh. Sherlock Holmes stories are a milestone in the field of crime fiction. Uh, I had to look real hard for fun facts. I've run out of websites that have any fun facts about this turd. Uh, but I'll take you on a little journey. One, the Fox family. The three teenage daughters that cleared, uh, claimed to hear strange rapping noises at night. Everyone's heard about them. Turns out they used their big toe to make rapping noises. So they'd sit at a table and they'd pretend to have a seance and talk to some kind of ghost. And they'd use Morse code or just you know one to two knocks or whatever. And uh, they used a big toe. Snap, snap. Really gross if you think about it. Um, turns out they were instant celebrities and they demonstrated their communication with the spirit by using taps and knocks and automatic writing. Uh, so, uh... Everyone loved him. They believed all about it. So, uh, one day in 1888, Margaret appeared before an audience of 2,000 to demonstrate how she had fraudulently produced these spirit wraps in her stocking feet on a small pine platform, six inches above the floor. Margaret produced wraps audible throughout the theater and cracking. Uh, she confessed that her and her sister had used other methods to produce these wraps. Sometimes he had an apple on a string and bounced it on the floor out of sight behind the furniture. So no one really looked. I mean, there's like a string hanging off this person's foot or presumably big toe, their power toe they're constantly using all the time. Nobody gave a shit. Um, but anyway, so she's showing all of her secrets and saying we faked it. I don't know why she decided to do it, but thank God she did. Well, that outraged spiritualists, and they simply refused to accept the validity of her confession. Uh, one of those who would not accept it, of course, idiot Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir, because he was knighted Arthur Conan Doyle. Moron. Uh... He was a convinced believer in spiritualism, and his response was, Nothing that she could say in that regard would in the least change my opinion, nor would it that of anyone else had become profoundly convinced that there is an occult influence connecting us with the invisible world. So, like a certain special someone that I know who's none of your business said, uh, I've stopped accepting all other information. I have made my decisions, and I will stay this way for the rest of my life. So, uh... Then, uh, he never learned his lesson, because in 1917, two teenage girls in Yorkshire produced photographs that were taken of fairies in their garden. Uh, basically, they had cutouts, cutouts of illustrations of fairies that they cut out and they posed next to and had uh, one of the sisters or whatever uh, take a photo of. Uh, so, you look at these photos, and you can see that they're illustrations of fairies. They're not photorealistic women dancing around with little wings. They're just drawings. You can see where they shaded in around the boobs and the necks and faces. It's ridiculous. So, uh, he believed it. Oh, boy, he believed it. He wrote a whole book about how fairies are real. He just loved the hell out of this stuff. Well, in 1977, Fred Gettings, this is what I thought, uh, if they got illustrations of fairies, they didn't draw them. Uh, they just cut them out from something. There must be a book. Well, this guy in 77, Fred Gettings, found the book. The book has illustrations of the same fairies they used. And this book is a collection of short stories, including Bambishy Joyce by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which he would have received a copy of from the publisher. So he had access to knowledge 
of this book with these drawings of fairies that these little kids cut out and posed next to, and he believed fairies were real, when in his own home, there's a copy of the book with the illustration. So this is a guy who's writing about an intelligent person uh, who can solve mysteries from basic clues, and he doesn't have, he's got the clues in his house. I'll stop. I hate this author, and I want this book to be done. Let's just move on. All right, let's just uh, get into chapter 10. I'm only uh, five more chapters away from being done, so I'm going to read two chapters in this episode. It's going to be a real long episode, so feel free to just turn this off and have basic self-respect for yourself and not read anything from this horrible author that was knighted by the Queen of England. Morons! Chapter 10. Oh, great. Another extract from the diary of Dr. Watson. If he's not writing letters to Holmes, he's just going to write in his diary about how he's lonely and he wishes somebody would love him. Instead, he's chasing after the approval of this moron. (laughs) Burp. So far, I have been able to quote from the reports which I have forwarded during these early days to Sherlock Holmes. Great. Now we get to learn about him writing to Sherlock Holmes from his diary. It's the worst book I've ever read. Now, however, I have arrived at a point in my narrative where I am compelled to abandon this method and to thrust once more to to my recollections, aided by the diary which I kept at the time. Oh, a few extracts from the latter will carry me on to those scenes which are indelibly fixed in every detail upon my memory. Oh, oh, I proceed then from the morning which followed our abortive chase of the convict and our other strange experiences upon the moor. October 16th. Oh, good. We're doing it by dates now. This is going to be laborious. A dull and foggy day with a drizzle of rain. That's great detail. The house is banked in with rolling clouds, which rise now and then to show the dreary curves of the moor, Ah, with thin silver veins upon the shades of the hills and the distant boulders gleaming where the light strikes upon their wet faces. It is uh, melancholy outside, and in, oh, the baronet is in a black re- reaction after the excitements of the night, and I am conscious myself of a weight at my heart and a feeling of impending danger. Ever-present danger, uh, which is more terrible because I'm unable to define it. And have I not cause for such a feeling? Consider the long sequence of incidents which have all pointed to some sinister influence which is at the work all around us. Oh, there is the death of the last occupant of the hall, uh, fulfilling so exactly the conditions of the family legend. Uh, Then there's the repeated reports uh, from peasants (laughs) of the appearance of a strange creature upon the moor. Oh, twice I have with my own ears, ears, heard the sound which resembled the distant bang of a hound. It is incredible, impossible, that it should really be outside the ordinary laws of nature, a spectral hound, which leaves material footmarks and fills the air with, it, with, it, with, it, with its howling, is surely not to be thought of. Stapleton may fall in with such a superstition, and Mortimer also. But if I have one quality upon earth, it is common sense. Oh, good. And nothing will persuade me to believe in such a thing. Uh, to do so would to be to descend to the level of these uh, pfft, uh, uh, poor peasants who are not so content with a mere fiend dog but must uh, needs describe him with the hellfire of shooting from his mouth and eyes. Holmes, Holmes would not listen to such fancies, and I am his agent. But facts are facts. If he just got a girlfriend, his whole life would change. And I have twice heard this crying upon the moor. Suppose that uh, there really were some huge hound loose upon it. Oh, that would go far to explain everything. But where could such a such a hound lie concealed? That's the way I feel about deer. I once lived in a place, a, a condo that I can't shut up about, that uh, had deer, deer running all over the place, and turkeys. Could never figure that out. And I thought to myself, here in the city, this suburb right outside a major city, where the hell are these deer hiding? Where do they go? How are they not all hit by cars? 
Uh, and the, the giant turkeys, they're huge, and they peck at your wheels when you're driving because they think they're trying to fight a giant beast. Uh, where you go? Well, I found out that the turkeys hide in trees at night, and they drop down in the morning. I used to drink coffee and watch them, these giant black things just drop out of trees and hit the ground and go, whoa, like that. And I go, ha ha, morons. But the deer, where the hell do the deer go? They're like horses. But facts are facts, and I have twice heard this crying upon the moor. Suppose that there were really some huge hound loose upon it uh, that would go far to explain everything. But where, where could such a hound lie concealed? And where did it get its food? This is what I thought, too. Where did it come from? And how is it that no one saw it uh, by day? I thought the same thing about deer. It must be confessed that the natural explanation offers almost as many difficulties as the other. And always, apart from the hound, there is the fact of human agency in London. The man in the cab, uh, and the letter which warned Sir Henry against the moor. Oh, uh, that was real. But it might have been the work of protecting friend as easily as enemy. Where is that friend or enemy now? Uh, has he remained in London, or has he followed us down here? Now, could he, could he be the stranger whom I saw upon the tour? Oh, it's true, I have had only the one glance at him, and yet there are some things which I am ready to swear. He is no one whom I have seen down here, and I have now met all the neighbors. The figure was far taller than that of Stapleton, far thinner than that of Franklin. Uh, Barrymore, it might have possibly been, but uh, we had left him behind us, and I am certain that he could not have followed us. A stranger, then, is still dogging us, just as a stranger dogged us in London. We could have never shaken him off if I could lay my hands upon that man. Then, at last, we might have found ourselves at the end of our difficulties. Uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to this one purpose, I must now devote all my energies. My first impulse was to tell Sir Henry all my plans. My second and wisest one is to play my own game and speak as little as possible to anyone. <laughs> and he is silent and distraught. What's distraught mean? Let's look that up. Distraught, uh, distracted, or absent-minded. Well, that seems dumb. I just wasted both our times there. His nerves have been strangely shaken by that the sound of the moor, and I will say nothing to add to his anxieties, but I will take my own steps to attain my own end. Oh, oh, we had a small scene this morning after breakfast. Barrymore asked leave to speak with Sir Henry. And they were closeted in his study some little time, sitting in the billiard room. I more than once heard the sound of voices raised. And I had a pretty good idea what the point was, which was under discussion. After a time, the baronet opened his door and called for me. Eh, eh, Barrymore considers that he has a grievance, he said. Yeah, he thinks that it was unfair on our part to hunt his, to hunt his brother-in-law down when, uh, when he, of his own free will... Uh, had told us the secret. It's actually not a bad point. He told the secret. I'm trying to feed this escaped convict. Uh, why'd you have to go hunt him down? You could just stand back at the house and be like, oh, oh, weird. All right, well, go feed him then. But instead, they decided to chase him down. They lost him. The butler was standing very pale, but very collected before us. Oh, I may have spoken too warmly, sir, said he. If, if I have, I am sure that I beg your pardon. And at the same time, I was very much surprised when I heard you two gentlemen come back this morning and, and learn that you had been chasing Selden. Oh, the poor fellow has enough to fight against without my putting more upon his track. Burp. If you had told us of your own free will, it would have been a different thing, uh, said the baronet. He only told us, or rather your wife only told us, when it was forced from you and you could not help yourself. I didn't think it would have taken advantage of it, Sir Henry. Indeed, I didn't. The man... The man is a public danger. There are lonely houses scattered all over the moor, uh, and he is a fellow who would stick at nothing. You only want to... Get a glimpse of his face to see that. I'll look at Mr. Stapleton's house, for example, with no one but himself to defend it. Now, oh, there's no safety for anyone until it is under lock and key. Now, you're breaking into no house, sir. I give you my solemn word upon that, but he will never give trouble to anyone in this country again. Oh, I assure you, Sir Henry, that in a very few days the necessary arrangements will have been made and he will be on his way to South America. For God's sake, sir, I beg of you. 
uh, not to let the police know that he's still on the moor. They have given up chase there, and he can lie quiet until the ship is ready for him. You can't, you can't tell him without getting my wife and me into trouble. Oh, I beg you, sir, to say nothing to the police. What do you say, Watson? Nah, I shrugged my shoulders. Uh, if you were safely out of the country, I would re- uh, relieve the taxpayer of the burden. But how about the, uh, the chance of... How is the taxpayer paying for him living in the moor? But how about the chance of this holding someone up before he goes? Oh, he would not do anything so mad, sir. We have provided him with all that he can want. To commit a crime would be to show where he was hiding. Well, that is true, said Sir Henry. Well, Barrymore... Not nah, God bless you, sir. And thank you for my heart. It would have killed my poor wife had he been taken again. Well, I guess we're aiding and abetting a felony, Watson, but after what we have heard, I don't feel as if I could give that man up. So there is an end to it. Um, All right, Barrymore, you can go. With a few broken words of gratitude, the man turned, but he hesitated and came back. You've been so kind to us, sir, that I should like to do the best I can for you in return. I I know something, uh, 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 Sir Henry, and perhaps I should have said it before, but but it was long after the uh, inquest I found out, and I've never breathed a word about it to a mortal man. Uh, It's about Sir Charles' death. Well, the Baronet and I were both upon our feet. Uh, Do you know I died? No, sir, I do not know that. Uh, Oh, uh, well, what then? I know why he was at the gate at that hour. It was to meet (laughs) a a woman. Uh, To meet a woman? He? Yes, sir. (laughs) And the woman's name? Oh, oh, I can't give you that name, sir. But I give you, I give you her initials. (laughs) Her initials were L. L. This is pathetic. (laughs) How do you know this, Barrymore? Well, Sir Henry, your uncle had a letter that morning. He had usually a great many letters, for he was a public man and well known and for his kind heart, so that everyone who was in trouble was glad to turn to him. But that morning, as it chanced, there was only this one letter, so I took the more notice of it, and it was from Coombe Tracy. And it was addressed in a woman's hand. Ah, well, well, sir, I thought no more of the matter, and never would have done it had it not come to my wife. Burp, only a few weeks ago, she was cleaning out Sir Charles's study. It had never been touched since his death, and she found the ashes of a burned letter in the back of the grate. The greater part of it was charred to pieces. Well, one little ship, the end of the page, hung together. And the writing could still be read, though it was gray on a black ground. It seemed to us uh, to be a, a postscript at the end of the letter. And it said, please, p- please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter and, and be at the gate by 10 o'clock. Oh, beneath it was signed the initials L. <coughs> L. Have you got that slip? No, sir. It crumbled all to bits after we moved it. Had Sir Charles received any other letters in the same writing? Well, sir, I took no particular notice of his letters, and I should not have noticed this one had it happened to come alone. And uh, you have no idea who L.L. is? No, sir, no more than you have. But I expect that we should lay our hands upon that lady should we know more about Sir Charles' death. Now, I, I can't understand, Barrymore, how you came to conceal this important information. Well, sir, it was immediately after that our own trouble came to us, and then again, sir, we are both of us very fond of Sir Charles, as we well might be considering all that has done for us. Oh, to rake this up couldn't be, uh, couldn't help the poor master. It is well to go carefully. Uh, then there's a lady in the case, even the best of us. Uh, you thought it might injure his reputation? Well, sir, I thought no good could come of it, uh, but now you have been kind to us, and I feel as if we should be treating you unfairly if we not tell you all that we know about the matter. Now, I'm very good, Barrymore, you can go. When the butler had left us, Sir Henry turned to me. Well, Watson, what do you think of this new light? That nah, seems to have left the darkness rather blacker than before. No, so I think. But if we can only trace LL, uh, it should clear up the whole business. We have gained that much. We know that there is someone who has the facts, if only we could find her. Uh, what do you think we should do? Let Holmes know all about it at once. It will give him the clue for which he has been seeking. I am much mistaken if it does not bring him down. 
I went at once to my room and drew up my report of the morning's conversation for Holmes, and it was evident to me that he had been very busy of late. Uh, for the notes, which I had from Baker Street, which were few and short, uh, with no comments upon the information which I had supplied, and hardly any reference uh, to, my, uh, to my mission. Oh, he's already getting snubbed. By this man he seeks approval from, he's barely getting any info from him. No doubt his blackmailing case is absorbing all his faculties, and yet this new factor must surely arrest his attention and renew his interest, and I, and I, I wish that, I were, that he were here. Oh, Christ, October 17th. All day today the rain poured down, rustling the ivy and dripping from the leaves, and I thought of the convict out in the bleak, cold, shelterless morning. Oh, you... Feel bad for him. Oh, it says poor devil, he even says. Whatever his crimes, he has suffered something to atone for them. Has he? What if it's like murder or something? What if he killed a kid? Then do you wish that he could go back into a nice dry home? And then I thought of the other one. The face in the cab, the figure against the moon. Was he also out in that deluged, the unseen watcher, the man of the darkness? In the evening, I put my waterproof on, and I walked far upon the sodden moor, full of dark imaginings, the rain beating upon my face, and the wind whistling upon my ears. God help those who wander into the great mire now, for even the firm uplands were becoming a morass. Oh, I found the black tor upon which I had seen the solitary watcher, and from its craggy summit I looked out uh, myself across the melancholy downs. Rain squalls drifted across their russet face, and the heavy slate-colored clouds hung low over the landscape, trailing in gray wreaths down the sides of the fantastic hills. In the distant hollow on the left, uh, half a uh, hidden by the mist, Oh, two thin towers of Baskerville Hall rose above the trees, and they were the only signs of human life which I could see. Save only for those prehistoric huts, which lay thickly upon the slopes of the hills. Uh, nowhere was there any trace of that lonely man whom I had seen upon the same spot two nights before. I'm surprised he mentioned the prehistoric huts and didn't go off in a whole thing about poor people and how he hates peasants. Did that in the last chapter. As I walked back, I was overtaken by Dr. Mortimer driving in his dog cart uh, over a rough moorland track, which led from the outlying farmhouse of the farmer. Uh, he has been very attentive to us, and hardly a day has passed that he has not called at the hall to see how we're getting on. And he insisted upon my climbing into the dog cart, and he gave me a lift homeward. Oh, I found him much troubled over the disappearance of his little spaniel. Oh, it had wandered upon the moor and had never come back. I gave him such consolation as I might, but I thought of the pony on the Grimpen Mire, and I do not fancy that he will see this little dog again. By the way, uh, Mortimer, said I as we jolted along the rough road, oh, I suppose there are few people living within driving distance of whom you do not know, eh? Uh, oh, hardly, I think. Uh, can you then tell me the name of any woman whose initials are... <laughs> L, L, he thought for a few minutes. No, said he, there are a few, uh, ooh, uh, gypsies <laughs> and laboring folk for whom I can't answer, but among the farmers of the gentry there are one whose initials are those. Uh, wait a bit, though, he added after a pause. There is Laura Lyons. Her initials are uh, L L. Yeah, we can tell because you said her name. But she lives in Coombe Tracy. Uh, who, who is she? I asked. Oh, she is Franklin's daughter. What? Old Franklin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The crank? Exactly. She married an artist named Lyons, who uh, came sketching on the moor, and he proved to be a black guard and deserted her. The fault, from what I hear, may not have been entirely on one side. Her father refused to have anything to do with her because uh, she had married without his consent, and perhaps for one or uh, two other reasons as well. So between the old sinner <laughs> and the young one, uh, the girl had a, a pretty bad time. Uh, how, how did she live? Oh, I fancy old Franklin allows her a pittance. Hmm. Ah, but it cannot be more, for his own affairs are considerably involved. Whatever she may be, uh, have deserved one could not allow her to go hopelessly uh, to the bad. Her story got about, and several of the people here did something to enable her to earn an honest living. Stapleton did for one and Sir Charles for another. And I gave a trifle myself. I, I, I was set up uh, in, a, in a typewriting business. 
Oh, he wanted to know the object of my inquiries, and I managed to satisfy this curiosity without telling him too much, for there was no reason why we should take anyone into our confidence. Tomorrow morning I shall find my way to Coombe Tracy and see if I can see this Miss Laura Lyons of Ivoquilical reputation. Uh, burp, as long, uh, a long step will have been made towards clearing one incident in this chain of mysteries. I am certainly developing the wisdom of the serpent. Oh, that's weird. For when Mortimer pressed this question to an inconvenient extent, I asked him casually to what type of Franklin's skull belonged, and so heard nothing about craniology for the rest of our drive. Oh, I have not lived for years with Sherlock Holmes for nothing. I have only one other incident to record upon this tempestuous and melancholy day. This was my conversation with Barrymore just now, which gives me one more strong card which I can play in due time. Mortimer had stayed to dinner, and he and the baronet played a cart. <laughs> What's a cart? Let's find out. Pronounced a carta. Oh, well, I said it wrong. A card game for two players, played originally in the 19th century France, in which 32 cards were used, and certain uh, cards may be discarded in exchange for others. Well, it sounds like Go Fish. They're playing Go Fish. The butler brought me my coffee into the library, and I took the chance to ask him a few questions. Well, said I, has this uh, precious relation of yours departed, or is he still lurking out yonder? Yeah, I don't know, sir. I hope to heaven he's gone, uh, for he has brought nothing but trouble here. Ha ha ha. And I have not heard of him since I left uh, left out food for him last, and that was, uh, oh, oh, three days ago. Uh, did you see him then? No, sir, but the food was gone when I went the next way, uh, when I went that way. Oh, that's probably just animals. But then he was certainly there. Uh, so would you would think, sir, unless it was the other man who took it. Ooh, I sat with my coffee cup halfway to my lips and stared at Burmer. Well, you know that there's a, another man then? Oh, yes, sir. There's another man upon the moor. Uh, have, you, uh, have you seen him? Oh, no, sir. How do you know of him then? Oh, Selden told me of him, sir, a week ago or more. He's hiding, too, but he's, uh, he's not a convict, as far as I can make out. Uh, I don't like it, Dr. Watson. I can tell you straight, sir, that I don't like it. I always spoke with a sudden passion of earnestness. Now listen to me, Barrymore. I have no interest in this matter but that of your master, and I have come here with no object except to help him. Tell me, frankly, what is it that you don't like? Barrymore hesitated for a moment, as if he regretted his outburst or found it difficult to express his own feelings in words. Ah, oh, it's all these goings-on, sir, he cried at last, waving his hand toward the rain-lashed window which faced the moor. Ah, uh, there's foul play somewhere, and there's black villainy brewing. To that I'll swear. Very glad I should be, sir, to see Sir Henry on this way back to London again. Yeah, but, but what is it that alarms you? Oh, look at Sir Charles's death. That was bad enough. For all that the crooner said, uh, look at the noises on the moor at night. There's not a man who would cross it after sundown if he was paid for it. Uh, look at his stranger hiding out yonder and watching and, 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 and waiting! Exclamation point. What's, it, what's he waiting for? Question mark. What, what does it mean? That uh, means no good to anyone in the name of Baskerville. I'm very glad that I shall be quit of all of it on the day that Sir Henry's new servants are ready to take over the hall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but what about this stranger, said I? Can you tell me anything about him? What did Selden say? Did he find out where he, uh, where he hid? Or, or what he's doing? I only saw him once or twice, but he is a deep one and gives nothing away. At first he thought that it was a, that he was the police, but soon found that he had some lay of his own, a, a kind of gentleman. He was, as far as he could see, but what he was doing he could not make out. Uh, and where did he say that he lived? Oh, among the old houses on the hillside, uh, the, uh, the stone huts where the old folk used to live. Oh, the old peasants. But how about, how about his food? Selden found out that he got a lad who works for him and brings all he needs. I dare say he goes to Coombe Tracy for what he wants. Ah, very good, Barrymore. We may talk further of this some other time. When the butler had gone, I walked over to the black window, and I looked through the blurred pane at the driving clouds. Oh, at the tossing outline of the windswept trees. It was a wild night indoors. 
And what must it be in stone hot upon the moor? What, what, what passion of hatred can it be which leads a man to lurk at such a place, such a time? And uh, what deep interest and purpose can he have that calls for such a trial? There, in that hut upon the moor, seems to lie the very center of that problem, which has vexed me so sorely. I swear that another day shall not have passed before I have done all I can uh, to do to reach the heart of the mystery. You want to you wanna hear another mystery? Um, New Year's Eve's coming up, and a certain special someone who's none of your business told me that uh, when the ball drops in Times Square, people... The people that gather there, shoulder to shoulder, crammed in that one little spot, uh, watching Ryan Seacrest um, you know, announce new boy bands, new exciting boy bands that are going to come and play for them and entertain them for the night. And those boy bands are things like Alien Ant Farm or uh, Lincoln Park. They're all standing there, and none of them are drinking water or anything. They're not allowed to bring food in. They're not allowed to bring beverages in. They're not allowed to bring anything. Why? Because they don't have toilets. I never knew this. When you go to Times Square to watch the ball drop, they don't have toilets. She literally sent me screenshots of timesquare.com or something. And it should, they say, like, oh, make sure you're hydrated because you're going to stand there for like nine hours and not allowed to leave. If you leave, you're not let back in. Uh, and you're supposed to sit there and just watch the ball drop. You can't pee. You can't poop. You can't eat anything. You just stand there with these giddy faces looking real, real happy to have Ryan Seacrest tell you about Alien Ant Farm's newest hit single. Uh, why? Why are these people there? When I was a kid, growing up in the Midwest, <clears throat> we always watched the ball drop an hour later. I mean, you could watch it live if you wanted to, but why? What's the point? What you want... <coughs> is you want the countdown so that you can actually see it and be like, oh, it's New Year's Eve. Ah, and then you kiss someone. When I was a kid, it was usually like my mom or the cat or if I was lucky, uh, I don't know, like a pillow or something. But uh, but so you, you watch it drop and you're like, well, that was an hour later. All these people that I'm seeing on the screen are either back home or dead. Uh, but I never knew that they were holding their pee in for hours and not allowed to leave. I guess there's restaurants nearby that you can pay like $1,000 or 500 bucks or something like Olive Garden to sit there at the table by the window and be like, yeah, look, uh, the ball's dropping. Mm, yeah, that's not that fun. And I can go pee anytime I want. That's the price you pay for the convenience of urine and feces getting out of your body to enjoy a ball dropping to know that the year has changed into a new one. This person told me that uh, people literally wear diapers. They go there wearing diapers because they know that they're going to pee at some point. Oh, I'm sure they try to keep those diapers as fresh as they can for as long as possible. They stand there, the little crinkly pants, or watching the ball. It's giddy. Have you ever watched the Ryan Seacrest and the, and the people when they cut to the audience when he's not on the stage and they're all shouting and waving at the camera? Who are they waving for? No one cares about television anymore. Getting on TV doesn't mean anything. Like getting on the local news or something. None of it means anything anymore. We have the internet. Like you're not famous because somebody saw you for a split second when Ryan Seacrest wasn't talking. Uh, they're all morons with glazed, glazed over eyes, hysterical smiles, just crazed people. Who are these people that are, one, not drunk, Two, not full from any brats or hamburgers or hot dogs or anything. They're just standing there for, if anything, they're crazed because they've been depleted of life's most basic needs for hours to watch a dumb ball drop. And they're all wearing pampers, waiting for the ball to drop while they piss themselves. It's disgusting. If they only knew that there's other options for you during times like that, like... Just go to doorglass.com, which is D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S.com. I'm sure that they can help you figure out some sort of glass enclosure with some sort of glass-based toilet that you can take a piss in or crap in or something. They'll help you. Doorglass.com, which is D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S.com. They're dedicated to fabricating, professionally installing the highest quality glass products for the nation's top manufacturers. You can have your own glass toilet that I'm sure they'll make small enough to put on like a backpack or something. You can carry it in and then just sit on it and then just take a shit 
while you're watching the ball drop. Their inventory, and this is the highest quality glass products, uh, their inventory combined with their years of experience makes them the premier source for installation and repair. The repair, the repair of your pride from not having to wear diapers this year, you did last year, and you went home a deflated person. What kind of, how is, how do you start the new year by pissing yourself into a diaper? Oh, they approach every project with the same goals, professionalism and integrity. And as I'm trying to explain with the whole glass toilet thing, which can be with reflective glass, they don't have to see the urine falling into the glass little enclosure they create for you. Uh, They can do all this with reflective glass. So it's all just like one giant, like a glass, like a mirror box. Be perfect for you to sit on that and do your thing and have pride as the ball drops and a new year starts where you're not swimming in your own piss in your pants. They're discreet. What do they do? Commercial storefronts, automatic entrances, windows, patio doors, mirrors, shower doors, installation, repair, and they'll design and build anything. Call them. Go to doorglass.com, which is D-O-R-G-L-A-S-S.com. Tell them, I'm going to Times Square, and I don't want to wear diapers. I don't want to piss myself. Help me. They'll probably come up with something the size of a Coke can that you can piss in. That you can fit any type of privates, both phallus and vaginal. Their clients are Pottery Barn, Williams Sonoma, Sherwin Williams, Portillo's, which is some sort of, I don't know, hot dog stand, the Salt Cave, which is in Minneapolis, it's gross, they won't let you touch their walls, and Applebee's. Just call them, for Christ's sake. If you're going to go to Times Square, even if you're not going to go to Times Square, if you're just going to be at some friend's party, but you don't want to miss out on the ball dropping, especially if you're in the Midwest and you're watching the repeat of the ball dropping in New York uh, like an hour later, and you know that everyone you're seeing on the screen is either gone home or dead, and you're going to I don't want to miss a second, and doorglass.com will make a small little glass reflective mirror cube that you just... Put your privates into, you rest them into the cube, just gently, and it'll probably be perfectly fitted. And you just sit there, you, you urine, they'll probably design it where it doesn't splash back up on you, and then you, you're fine. You just throw the cube out in the backyard or something and let somebody else deal with it. Let Lord, uh, doorglass.com do that for you. Well, with that, uh, why don't we go upstairs, take a little time for ourselves. It's the new year. Why don't we start it off right, huh? Just the two of us. Let's go up to my master bedroom, huh? With my four-poster bed. Let's just get up there. Let's have a good time. Okay, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, boy, I can't wait to see what... Uh, what are you... What is that? Why are you wearing a pantsuit? You're wearing a pantsuit with some kind of weird scarf... That's lime green. I don't understand. What's this? What you leave on the on the bed? A book called The Weather Girl? Oh, for Christ's sake. The Weather Girl by Rachel Lynn Solomon? Oh, for Christ. All right, fine. Uh, what, what's this book about? A TV meteorologist and a sports reporter scheme to reunite their divorced bosses with an unforecasted results in this electrifying romance from the author of The XR. Is that why you're wearing the, the green... You realize with the background, if you're going to be doing the weather, your little scarf's going to show through and you're going to see the weather behind your scarf. What are you doing? You don't even know what you're doing. Ari Abrams has always been fascinated by the weather. And she loves almost everything about her job as a TV meteorologist. Her boss, legendary Seattle weatherman Torrance Hale. Torrance Hale is too distracted by her tempestuous relationship with her ex-husband, uh, the station's news director, to give Ari the mentorship she wants. Ari, who runs on sunshine and optimism, is at her wit's end. The only person who seems to understand how she feels is sweet but reserved sports reporter Russell Berenger. In the aftermath of a disastrous holiday party, oh, that must have sounded very pretty rich, Ari and Russell decide to team up and to solve their boss's relationship issues. Between secret gifts and double dates, they start nudging their bosses back together. <laughs> but their well-meaning meddling backfires with the real chemistry built between Ari and Russell. Oh, working closely with Russell means allowing him to get to know parts of herself that Ari keeps hidden from everyone. Will he be able to embrace her dark clouds as well as her clear skies? This sounds horrible. Uh, what's this coming out? January 11th, uh, 2022. You can pre-order from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, which is a horrible place, Hudson Booksellers, Indiebound, Powell's Target, uh, Bookshop.org, that bank will tell you all about some other time, and 
Walmart. Well, that's horrible. No, stop trying to act like you're talking about the weather. You don't even know what the weather is. You're looking at your phone. You're just reading it off your phone. Why don't we go back downstairs and finish reading this next chapter, this goddamn story? Well, since the recording of the last chapter in this one, I got COVID. Uh, So I feel better today and thought I made so many references to New Year's Eve. I have to put this out technically before New Year's Eve. By any means. So enjoy a stuffy-nosed Glenn. Uh, My COVID was fine. I got vaccinated. So the only thing that happened is I just had another sinus thing and, uh, and a cough. So I'm sure you get to hear all that in this final chapter of the episode. Uh, Let's dive in to chapter 11, The Man of the Tour. Oh, that's good. It's already starting. The extract from my private diary, which forms the last chapter, has good. Are we done with the private diaries now? Brought my narrative up to the 18th of October, a time when these strange events began to move swiftly toward their terrible conclusion. The incidents of the next few days are indelibly graven upon my recollection, and I can tell them without reference to the notes made at the time. Oh, I start them from the day which succeeded uh, that upon which I had established two facts of great importance. Uh, the one that Mrs. Laura Lyons of Coombe Tracy had written to Sir Charles Baskerville and made an appointment with him at the very place and hour that he met his death. The other, that the lurking man upon the moor was to be found among the stone huts upon the hillside. With these two facts in my possession, I felt that either my... I'm love... uh, Thank God they're giving a recap of the previous chapter in this chapter because it's been... Burp. For the most of a week. Uh, So I've kind of forgotten everything I read in the previous one. But that's right, there's a mysterious man in the moor, and he's not the felon. Uh, With these two facts in my possession, I felt that either my intelligence or my courage must be deficient if I could not throw some further light upon these dark places. Oh, oh, I had no opportunity to tell the baronet uh, what I had learned about Mrs. Lyons upon the evening before, for Dr. Mortimer remained with him at cards until it was very late. Burp. This time I'm burping because I swallow so much air through my mouth, because I don't breathe through my nose anymore. Don't need it. I've moved past it. I'm evolving. At breakfast, however, I informed him about my discovery and asked him whether he would care to accompany me to Coombe Tracy. uh, At first, he was very eager to come, but on second thoughts, it seemed to both of us that if I went alone, the results might be better. Oh, the more formal we made the visit, the less information we might obtain. I left Sir Henry behind. Therefore, not without some prickings of conscience, and drove off upon my new quest. When I reached Coombe Tracy, I told Perkins to put up the horses, and I made inquiries for the lady whom I had come to interrogate. Had no difficulty in finding her, uh, finding her rooms, uh, which were central and well-appointed. A maid showed me in without ceremony, and as I entered the sitting room, a lady, a lady who was sitting before a Remington typewriter, sprang up with a pleasant smile of welcome. Ah, her face fell, however, when she saw that I was a stranger and sat down again and asked me uh, the object of my visit. Well, clearly she was waiting for someone that we're going to find out about later. The first impression left by Mrs. Lyons was one of extreme beauty. This is the superior writing of this author. It's like, uh, well, that's going to be a detail we'll pick up later, I'm fairly certain. I just don't like this guy. The first impression left by Mrs. Lyons was one of extreme beauty. Her eyes and her hair were the same rich hazel color. Her hair was hazel? For that time? That's weird. And her cheeks, hope they're not hazel, though considerably freckled, were flushed with an exquisite bloom of the brunette. Uh, okay, the dainty pink, which lurks at the heart of the sulfur rose. Oh, well, look at that. I should start calling people that. Ah, your hair is like a sulfur rose. Now I'd probably get fired or the cops called on me. Admiration was, I repeat, the first impression, but the second was criticism. Oh, there was something suddenly wrong with the face. Oh, he's turning into a jerk now. Some coarseness of the expression. Some some hardness, perhaps, of, uh, 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 of, of eye... Uh, some looseness of, of lip, 
which marred its perfect beauty. Oh, this guy's a jerk. I don't think he gets laid by anyone. Why is he so picky? But these, of course, are afterthoughts. At the moment, I was simply conscious that I was in the presence of a very handsome woman. Well, now she's been reduced to handsome. This is the reason why Watson's alone. He stifles himself at every turn. Uh, and that she was asking me the reasons for my visit. I had uh, not quite understood until that instant how delicate my mission was. I have the pleasure, said I, of knowing your father. Oh, it was a clumsy introduction, and the lady made me feel it. Oh, there's nothing in common between my father and me, she said. I owe him nothing, and his friends are not mine. If it were not for the late Sir Charles Baskerville and some other kind of hearts, I might have starved for all of that my father cared. It was about the late Sir Charles Baskerville that I have come here to see you. The freckles started out on the lady's face. What the hell? Leave her face alone. And what can I tell you about him? She asked, and her fingers played nervously over the stops of her typewriter. Oh, you knew him, did you not? I've already said I owe a great deal to his kindness. Uh, if I'm able to support myself, it's largely due to the interest which he took in my unhappy situation. Did you correspond with him? Uh, the lady looked quite quickly up with an angry gleam in her hazel eyes. What is the object of these questions? She asked sharply. The object is to avoid a public scandal. It is better that I should ask them here than that matter should pass outside our control. Oh, she was silent. Oh, and her face was still very pale. Uh, at last, she looked up with something reckless and defiant in her manner. Well, I'll answer, she said. What are your questions? And did you correspond with Sir Charles? I certainly wrote him uh, once or twice to acknowledge his delicacy eh, eh, and his generosity. Uh, have you the dates of those letters? No. Uh, have you ever met him? Yes, and once or twice when he came into Coombe, Tracy. Uh, he was a very retiring man, and he preferred to do uh, good by stealth. What does that mean? But if you, if you saw him so seldom and wrote so seldom, how did he know enough about your affairs to be able to help you, as you say uh, that he has done? Ah, oh, she met my difficulty with the utmost readiness. Well, there were several gentlemen who knew my sad story and united to help me. Uh, one was Mr. Stapleton, a, a neighbor and intimate friend of Sir Charles's. He was exceedingly kind, and it was through him that Charles learned about I have the hots and colds. Now, I hate my cardigan because I'm hot. I love my cardigan. I hate my cardigan. So the cardigan's coming off there. <clears throat> I'm just going to sit here and sweat. I knew already that Sir Charles Baskerville had made Stapleton his almon almoner, not looking it up, I'm sure it involves money, upon several occasions, so the lady's statement bore the impress of truth upon it. Did you ever write to Sir Charles asking him to meet you? I continued. Oh, Mrs. Lyons flushed with anger again. Really, sir? Uh, this is a very extraordinary question. I am sorry, madam, but I must repeat it. Uh, then the answer is certainly not. Uh, not on the day of Sir Charles's death. The flush had faded in an instant, and deathly face was before me. Her dry lips could not speak the quote-unquote no, which I saw rather than heard. Surely your memory deceives you, said I. I could even quote a passage of your letter. It ran, please, please, as you're a gentleman, burn this letter, and it'll be at the gate by ten o'clock. I thought that she had fainted. But she recovered herself by a supreme effort. Is there uh, no such thing as a gentleman? She gasped. Do you, or you do Sir Charles an injustice. He did burn the letter. But sometimes the letter may be legible even when burned. What? Where do they get? Okay, this must have been in the last chapter that I glossed over at the, the beginnings, the, the roots of my COVID. Uh, you acknowledge now that you wrote it? Yes, I did write it, she cried, pouring out her soul in a torrent of words. I did write it. Uh, why should I deny it? I have no reason to be ashamed of it. I wished him to help me. I believe that if he had an interview, I could gain his help, so I asked him to meet me. Uh, uh, but why at such an hour? Uh, because I only just learned that he was going to London next day and might be away for months. Oh, there were reasons why I could not get there earlier. Uh, but why a rendezvous in the, in the garden instead of visit the house? Burp. Swallowing air. Do you think a woman could go alone at that hour? To a bachelor's house? Well, what happened when you did get there? I never went. Miss Lyons. Now I swear upon you, I hold all sacred. I never went. Something intervened to prevent my going. Now, yeah, what was it? That's a private matter. I cannot tell it. 
Oh, you acknowledge then that you made an appointment with Sir Charles at the very hour and place which you had at his death, but you deny that you kept the appointment. That is the truth. Again and again I cross-questioned her, but I could never get past that point. Miss Lyons, said I, as I rose from the long and inconclusive interview, you are taking a very great responsibility and putting yourself in a very false position by not making an absolutely clean breast of all that you know. If I have to call in the aid of the police, you will find how seriously you are compromised. And if your position is innocent, uh, why did you in the first place to insist and deny having written to Sir Charles upon that date? Because I feared that some false conclusion might be drawn from it, uh, and that I might find myself involved in a scandal. Yeah, why were you so pressing that Sir Charles should destroy your letter? If you could read the letter, you'd know. I did not say that I had read all the letter. Well, you quoted some of it. No, I quoted the postscript. Uh, the letter had said, uh, as I said, had been burned, and it was not all legible. I ask you once again, why is it that you were so pressing that Sir Charles should destroy this letter which received on the day of his death? Now the man is a very private one. Ah, the more reason why you should avoid public investigation. Well, I'll tell you then. <laughs> if you have heard anything of my unhappy history, you will know that I made a rash marriage. And had a reason to regret it. I have heard so much. My life has been one incessant persecution from a husband whom I abhor. The law is upon his side, and every day I am faced by the possibility that he yeah, may force me to live with him. Uh, and at the time that I wrote this letter to Sir Charles, I had learned that there was a prospect of my regaining my freedom if certain expenses uh, could be met. Uh, it meant everything to me. Peace of mind, uh, happiness, self-respect, everything. I knew Sir Charles' generosity, and I thought that if he heard the story from my own <laughs> lips, <laughs> how he'd help me. Uh, then how is it that you did not go? Because I received help in the interval from another source. Why then, or she casts a wide net, good for her. Why then did you not write to Sir Charles and explain this? Uh, so should I have done had I not seen his death in the paper the next morning? The woman's story hung coherently together, and all my questions were unable to shake it. I could only check it by finding if she had, indeed, instituted divorce proceedings against her husband at or about the time of the tragedy. It's unlikely that she would dare to say that she had not been to Baskerville Hall if she had really been, for a trap would be necessary to take her there, and could not have returned to Coombe, Tracy, until that early hours of the morning. Such an excursion could not be kept secret. Uh, the problem was, therefore, that she was telling the truth, or uh, at least uh, a part of the truth. Oh, I came away baffled and disheartened. Once again, I had reached the dead wall, which seemed to be built across every path which I tried to get at the object of my mission. And yet, the more I thought of the lady's face and of her manner, and the more I felt that something was being held back from me, why should she turn so pale? Oh, why should she fight against every admission until it was forced from her? Oh, why, oh, why she have been so recipient at the time of the tragedy? Oh, surely the explanation of all this could not be as innocent as she would make me believe. Uh, for the moment, I could proceed no further in that direction, but must turn back to the other clue which has to be sought for among the stone huts upon the moor. And that was the most vague direction. I realized it as I drove back and noted how hill after hill showed traces of the ancient people. Barrymore's only indication had been that the stranger lived in one of these abandoned huts, and many hundreds of them are scattered throughout the length and breadth of the moor. But I had my own experience uh, for a guide since it had shown me the man himself standing upon the summit of the Black Tor. Uh, that, then, should be the center of my search. And from there, I should explore every hut upon the moor until I lighted upon the right one. If this man were inside it, I should find out from his own lips... Yeah. And at the point of my revolver, if necessary, oh, well, that's a little rough, uh, who he was and why he had dogged us so long. He might slip away from a, I thought in England you don't really get guns. Huh. Well, I guess if you're friends with Sherlock Holmes, he's got inside connections to smuggle you guns from the underground. I might slip away from us and crowd of Regent Street, but it would puzzle him to do so upon the lonely moor. And on the other hand, if I should find the hut and its tenant should not be within it, I must remain there, however long the vigil, until he returns. Oh, Holmes missed him in London, and it would need indeed be a triumph for me if I could run him to the earth where my master had failed. Yeah. Luck had been against us again and again in this inquiry, but now at last it came to my aid, and the messenger of good fortune was none other than Mr. Franklin, who is, who is standing 
gray-whiskered and red-faced outside the gate of his garden, uh, which opened onto the high road along which I traveled. Uh, "'Good day, uh, Dr. Watson,' cried the unwanted good humor. Oh, he cried with unwanted good humor. Uh, "'You must really give your horses a rest and come in and have a glass of wine and to congratulate me.' My feelings towards him were very far from being friendly after what I had heard of his treatment of his daughter, uh, but I was anxious to send Perkins and the wagonette home.' And the opportunity was a good one. I alighted and sent a message to Sir Henry that I should walk over in time for dinner. Then I followed Frank Land into his dining room. That's a great day for me, sir. Uh, one of the red-letter days of my life, he cried with many chuckles. <laughs> and I have brought off a double event. Time me to teach them in these parts that law is law, and that there is no man here who does not fear to invoke it. I have established a right of way through the center of old Middleton's Park. Slap across it, sir, within a hundred yards of his own front door. And hey, what do you think of that? I will teach these magnets that they cannot ride roughshod over the rights of the commoners. Confound them! Exclamation point. And I've closed the wood where the fernworthy folk used to picnic. These infernal people seem to think that there is no rights of property, uh, uh, and that they can swarm where they like with their papers and their bottles. Both cases decided, Dr. Watson, and both in my favor. I haven't had such a, a day since I had Sir John Moreland for trespass because he shot in his own warrant. Yeah, how, how on earth did you do that? Look it up in the books, sir. Ah, yeah, we'll repay reading. Franklin versus Moreland, court of the Queen's Bench. Oh, it cost me 200 pounds, but I got my verdict. Uh-oh, burp. Oh. I'm just sucking in air and flapping my gums. Boy, are you all paying the price for it. Did it do you any good? None, sir, none. I am proud to say that I have no interest in the matter. I act entirely from a sense of public duty. I have no doubt, eh, for example, that the fernworthy people will burn me in effigy tonight. And I told the police last time that they, that they did it, that they should stop these disgraceful exhibitions. So they burned him in effigy before. The county consti constabulary... I'm sick. I'm moving forward. Is in a scandalous state, sir, and it has not afforded me with the protection to which I am entitled. The case of Franklin versus Regina. Regina? Regina. Hmm. I basically just made it sound dirty. Regina. Okay. We'll bring the matter before the attention of the public, and I told them that they would have occasion to regret their treatment of me, and already my words have come true. How so? I asked. The old man put on a very knowing expression, because I could tell them what they were dying to know, but nothing would induce me to help the rascals in any way. I had been casting round for some excuse by which I could get away from this gossip, uh, but now I began to wish to hear more of it. I had seen enough of the contrary nature of the old sinner to understand that any strong sign of interest would be the surest way to stop his confidences. Uh, some poaching case, uh, no doubt, said I with an indifferent manner. Ah, ha, ha, ah, my boy, I very much more important matter than that, exclamation point. Uh, what about the convict on the moor? Oh, I stared. You don't mean that you know where he is, said I. No, I may not know exactly where he is, but I am quite sure that I could help find a, help the police find it, lay their hands on him. It has never struck you that the way to catch a man was to find out where he got his food and, so to, and to trace it to him. Well, you certainly seem to be getting uncomfortably near the truth. No doubt, said I. But how do you know that he is anywhere upon the moor? I know it because I've seen it with my own eyes. The messenger who takes him his food. Oh, my heart sank for Barrymore. It was a serious thing to be in the power of a spiteful old busybody. Uh, but his next remark took a weight from my mind. You'll be surprised to hear that his food is taken to him by a child. And I see him every day through my telescope <laughs> upon the roof. Man, that's creepy. He passes along the same path at the same hour. And to whom should he be going except to the convict? Here was luck indeed, and yet I suppressed all appearance of interest. Uh, a child. Barrymore had said that our unknown was supplied by a boy, and it was on his track, but not upon the convicts, that Frank Land had stumbled. If I could get his knowledge, it might say be a long, weary hunt, but incredulity and indifference were evidently my strongest cards. I should say that it was much more likely uh, that it was the son of one of the Moreland shepherds uh, taken out his father's dinner. The least appearance of opposition struck fire out of the old autocrat. 
Oh, his eyes seemed malignantly, looked malignantly at me, and his gray whiskers bristled like those of an angry cat. Indeed, sir, said he, pointing out over the wide, stretching moor. Uh, do you see that black tower over yonder? Uh, well, do you see that low hill uh, beyond the thornbush upon it? Uh, 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 it is the stoniest part of the whole moor. It is that, uh, that a place where a shepherd would be likely to take his station. Uh, <laughs> and your suggestion, sir, is a most absurd one. I meekly answered that I had spoken without knowing all the facts. My submission pleased him and led him to further confidences. Oh, you may be sure, sir, that I have very good grounds before I come to an opinion. Oh, I've seen the boy again and again with his bundle every day and sometimes twice a day. And I've been able, but wait a moment, Dr. Watson, do my eyes deceive me or is there at present moment something moving upon that hillside? It was several miles off, but I could distinctly see a small dark dot uh, against the dull green and gray. Come, sir, come, nah, cried Franklin, uh, rushing upstairs. You will see with your own eyes and judge for yourself. Because oh, the pervert's got a telescope. The telescope, a formidable instrument mounted upon a tripod, stood upon the flat leads of the house. Franklin clapped his eye to it and gave a cry of satisfaction. Quick, Dr. Watson, quick, before he passes over the hill. There he was. Sure enough. Small urchin, oh, with a little bundle upon his shoulder, toiling slowly up the hill. Poor little kid. And when he reached the crest, I saw the ragged, uncouth figure outlined for an instant against the cold blue sky. He looked round him with a furtive and stealthy air, as one who dreads pursuit. Uh, then he vanished over the hill. Well, am I right? Certainly. Uh, there is a boy who seems to have some secret errand. And uh, what the errand is, even a country a constable could guess. Uh, but not one word shall they have from me. And I bind you to secrecy also, Dr. Watson. Not a word. Do you understand? Uh, just as you wish. Ah, they've treated me shamefully, shamefully. When the facts come out in Franklin versus Regina, not Regina, I venture to think that a thrill of indignation will run through the country. Nothing would induce me to help the police in any way. For all they cared, it might have been me instead of my effigy, which these rascals burned at the stake. Oh, surely you're not going. You will help me to empty the decanter in honor of this great occasion. But I resisted all his solicitations and succeeded in dissuading him from his announced intention of walking home with me. Oh, this guy's insufferable. I kept the road as long as his eye was on me, and then I struck off across the moor and made for the stony hill over which the boy had disappeared. Oh, everything was working in my favor. And I swore that it would not be through lack of energy or perseverance that I should miss the chance which fortune had thrown my way. Oh, the sun was already sinking. When I reached the summit of the hill, and the long slopes beneath me were all golden green on one side and gray shadow on the other. Oh, oh, a haze lay low upon the farthest skyline, out of which jutted the fantastic shapes of Belliver eh, and Vixen Tor. Over the wide expanse there was no sound and no movement. One uh, great gray bird, uh, a gull eh, or a curlew, uh, soared aloft in the blue heaven, uh, eh, he and I seemed to be the only living things between the huge arch of the sky and the desert beneath it. Ah, the barren scene, the sense of loneliness, and the mystery and urgency of my task all struck a chill in my heart. Ah, the boy was nowhere to be seen, but down beneath me in a cleft of the hills there was a circle of old stone huts, and in the middle of them there was one which retained sufficient roof to act as a screen against the weather. My heart leaped within me as I saw it. This must be the burrow where the stranger lurked. At last, my foot was on the threshold of his hiding place. His secret was within my grasp. Oh, I'm going to burp again. Oh, God, I'm talking a lot. As I approached the hut, walking as warily as Stapleton would do when he poised a uh, poised net, he drew near the settled butterfly. I satisfied myself that the place had indeed been used as a habitation. A vega, oh, another burnt pathway among the boulders led to the dilapidated opening which served as a door. Oh, all was silent within. The unknown might be lurking there or he might be prowling on the moor. My nerves tingled <laughs> with the sense of adventure. <laughs> Throwing aside my cigarette. Oh, he smokes cigarettes, I forgot. And I closed my hand upon the butt of my revolver. And walking swiftly up to the door, I looked in. The place... The place was empty. Uh, but there were ample signs that I had not come across a false scent. This was certainly where the man lived. 
They have some blankets rolled on and waterproof uh, lay upon that very stone slab upon which Neolithic man had once slumbered. The ashes of a fire were heaped in the rude grate. Uh, beside it lay some uh, cooking utensils uh, and a bucket <laughs> half full of water. And a, a litter of empty tins showed that the place had been occupied eh, for some time. And I saw, as my eyes became accustomed to the checkered light, uh, a pannikin uh, and a half full bottle of spirits standing in the corner. In the middle of a hut, a flat stone served the purpose of a table. And upon this stood a small cloth bundle, the same, no doubt, which I had seen through the telescope upon the shoulder of the boy. And it contained a, a loaf of bread, a, a tinned tongue, gross, and two tins of preserved peaches. Oh, that sounds nice. And as I set it down again, after having examined it, my heart leapt to see that beneath it, there lay a sheet of paper with writing upon it. Now I raised it, and this is what I read, roughly scrawled in pencil. Dr. Watson has gone to Coombe Tracy. Well, for a minute I stood there with the paper in my hands, thinking out the meaning of this curt message. Uh, it was I, then, and not Sir Henry, who was being dogged by this secret man. He had not followed me himself, but he had set an agent, the boy perhaps, upon my track. And this was his report. Possibly I had taken no steps since I had been upon the moor, which had not been observed or reported. Always there was this feeling of an unseen force, a fine net drawn around us with infinite skill and delicacy, uh, holding us so lightly that it was only at some supreme moment that one realized that one was indeed entangled in its meshes. If there was one report, there might be others. So I looked around the hut and searched them, and there was no trace, however, of anything of the kind, nor can I discover any sign which might indicate the character of the attentions of the man who lived in this singular place, save, this is no period so far, save that he must be of Spartan habits and cared little for the comforts of life, period. That was ridiculous. When I thought of the heavy rains and looked at the gaping roof, I understood how strong and immutable must be the purpose which I kept him in that inhospitable abode. Was he our malignant enemy? Or was he by chance our guardian angel? Yeah, and I swore that I would not leave into the hut until I knew. Outside, the sun was sinking low in the west and blazing with scarlet gold. Its reflection was shot back in the ruddy patches of the distant pools which lay amid the great Grimpen mire. Uh, there were two towers of Baskerville Hall, and there a distant blur of smoke which marred the village of Grimpen. Between the two, oh, that's the burning in effigy. Between the two, behind the hill, was the house of the Stapletons. All was sweet and mellow and peaceful in the golden evening light. And yet, as I looked at them, my soul shared none of the peace of nature that quivered at the vagueness and the terror of that interview which every instant was bringing near. Uh, with tingling nerves, but with a fixed purpose, I sat in the dark recess of the hut and waited with somber patience for the coming of its tenant. And then at last I heard him. Far away came the sharp clink of a boot, striking upon a stone, uh, and then uh, another, and, uh, and then yet another, uh, coming nearer uh, and nearer. And I, I shrank back into the darkest corner and cocked the pistol in my pocket, determined not to discover myself until I had an opportunity of seeing something of the stranger. There was a long pause which showed that he had stopped, uh, that once more the footsteps approached, and uh, a shadow fell across the opening of the hut. Uh, it's a lovely evening, my dear Watson, said a well-known voice. I really think that you will be more comfortable outside than in. Oh, God, I bet it's Holmes. Well, with that, let's uh, recap what I forgot that I read in the previous chapter and uh, talk about what I just finished now. Well, uh, let's recap what happened uh, in these chapters. Uh, chapter 10, eh, basically they just talk about the convict and how they're just going to let the convict go. Like, get out of here. Go find another country to go sit in. Um, that's kind of all I remember out of that. Uh, this chapter, oh, the excitement. As he goes to question uh, Linda or Lydia Lyons, who cares? Uh, Already dropping little Easter eggs or little uh, clues that are going to come up later when a smarter Sherlock Holmes picks up on him because she's waiting for another man because she's like a cartoon and she gets all excited and jumps up even though anyone can walk through that door. She's in a public place. Uh, and then uh, questions her and she's a piece of shit. And then after that, he goes to see Frank Land, who's just a piece of shit. 
Uh, and also a pervert, because he's on top of the roof with the telescope, and he's just watching little boys walking through the woods. So he's creepy. Um, and he deduces that this little boy is delivering shit to another person. So, uh, so Watson uh, decides to go out there in the dark so he can't be peeped, peeped by the pervert. Uh, and then finds one of the many stone ancient huts and uh, crawls right in. Reads a letter that says, uh, Watson's uh, in whatever, Coombe Tracy. And uh, so he's like, wow, they're watching me. Is he a devil or a guardian angel? So that's weird. Uh, and then he hides in there and, of course, cocks his gun inside his pants, which doesn't seem like the smartest thing in the world to do. Uh, I don't know, basic gun safety. Hold it away from you. Don't cock it. Keep the finger off the trigger because uh, you could accidentally fire it off. I don't know. Uh, why do I care so much? I'm not sure. Uh, and then finally a man walks up all creepily, uh, stealthily, with his little boots. For some reason, boots clinking on stones. Uh, I have boots, and the soles of them are soft. They rarely ever clink. But apparently back then, everyone had steel bottoms and tap danced their way everywhere they went. So, uh, he walks up and he goes, ah, Dr. Watson, it's a pleasure to see you. So I'm thinking, ah, it's going to be Holmes. Okay, whatever. I can already tell. Uh, maybe I'll be wrong. I also don't care. I don't like this author. I don't like this book. Uh, what's good? I don't know. There is creepy environments. There's a reason why this story is the most, uh, the most famous, I think, probably out of all of his stories. It's because it's got creepy stuff. It's got a wolf, a big wolf. It's got a creepy moor. It's got... Reclusive rich people that hate poor people. I do like that the poor people are burning this guy in effigy because he won't let them have a picnic on his land. Burn his castle down. Uh, what sucks, rich people? What do we learn? Uh, I don't know. Don't be so supportive of the rich. Uh, maybe you should scold him about how he's treating the peasants. Maybe they'll stop burning him in effigy if he just would like let them have a picnic on his land. When I was a kid, growing up in my crap neighborhood, uh, our crap neighborhood was located right next to a golf course. And so you have this big, beautiful land with rolling green hills and beautiful trees and little ponds and all this kind of cute stuff. So, of course, little kids are going to want to go over there. So we hopped the fence and we went over there. And, man, they chased us off like crazy because, God damn it, we're not letting the poor hang out in our expensive golf course. So hearing about this guy kicking in the burning an effigy, I would have been doing it too. Uh, sucks to him. Well, with that, thanks for listening. Uh, I technically am going to get this out before New Year's happens. So hooray for me. Not even COVID can stop me. Uh, and uh, I hope everyone has a better year. And I hope nobody else gets COVID. For Christ's sake. I'm going to go upstairs and sweat now. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. You can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, uh, along with episodes from the Book Boys and uh, blah, blah, blah. You can also find me on Instagram, uh, which is uh, House Nuzzle. And conveniently enough, uh, Twitter, which is also at House Nuzzle. Annoyingly, YouTube made me pick a name instead of just a house nuzzle. So you got Glenn Nuzzles. So I guess you search for that if you want to watch a screen that doesn't do anything and just hear my voice. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left.